system. You see some common ranks here, but um, a lot will not have these ranks. Some have additional ones, some have inconsistent numbers of ranks, things like that. And even if they have the same taxonomy system, they often encode this information differently. There's really not a lot of standardization at this point, and I'll show you some of that variation um, in the upcoming slides. And also just visualizing this data is difficult. So this is kind of some of the challenges we're hoping to solve uh, using these packages. And uh, an important thing to keep in mind is that while we're talking about biological tax, uh, taxonomy here, this method can be applied to anything hierarchical. Um, so I've used it for geography before. You can even have states within countries with you know, larger units. Um, so anything hierarchical can be used in this framework. Here's some examples of places you might encounter taxonomy data that you need to work with. Um, NCBI agenda is a big one. Uh, there's a taxonomy assigned every sequence. A species occurrence data like GBIF or, and uh, Atlas of Living Australia have a taxonomic um, information associated with every entry, and things like museum records, they keep like, lists of species and things. So uh, here's an example of what DNA sequence databases tend to look like. Um, this is a format called a FASTA file. We have a header that describes the sequence and the sequence itself. There's really no fixed format for that header. You can put anything, anything you want, and so people tend to put all sorts of things in there. Um, Underlined here is the sources of taxonomic information you could use um, in these headers, and there'll be different sources for different formats. NCBI has an accession number, which is that first series of letters and numbers. Um, they can use to look up the taxonomic information. You can also use the taxonomic name. Unite, RDP, and Silva are other reference uh, databases of DNA, and they have full classification, but each encoded different. The ranks are encoded differently, and Silva doesn't have enough information. So there's just a lot of diversity in how this information is actually encoded and how you're going to get it when you need it. This is an example of a GBIF's Archaea database. I'm looking at a CSV here, and it's only you looking at columns four through eight, and each column is a different rank. In the Smithsonian's uh, CSV file for the mammal database, it's all one column separated by uh, separated some diversity here. You'll notice it's also in the opposite order. It's going from like genus to phylum instead of phylum to genus, like is would be more typical. So to solve some of these issues, uh, Scott Chamberlain and I have been developing the taxa package. This uh, defines some R6 classes, which is a class system in R, uh, to hold taxa, taxonomies, and any user-defined data. It also defines uh, flexible parsers to convert all these formats and more into um, these classes so you can work with them. It implements the uh, functions similar to dpliers, filter, range, mutate, that kind of thing um, to work with these classes. So it uses that kind of um, philosophy. And it also has information to get, to get um, lists and vectors of taxon information that are more usable with, um, with standard LApply and you know, more traditional R techniques. Metacoder is the other package. It um, is used for a couple things. Uh, the relevant thing here is visualizing taxonomic data. This is a taxonomic tree with color and size encoding some statistic of interest. This could be any statistic you want. The, um, this is a, a pretty simple um, graph relative to what it can do. Um, but in this case, we're looking at the number of observations associated with each taxon in the GBIF Archaea CSV file that I showed you previously. And this uh, shows how you can use taxa and metacoder together. Um, in the first line, we're reading a CSV file. We're then using one of taxa's parsers, which I'll uh, go into more, to convert this to one of those objects uh, I talked about. And then we're filtering out any taxa that have no name. Um, and, we're, and we're plotting the number of observations in that data set using both the node size and the node color. And actually the nodes and the node size, nodes color, those can be different. Edge size, edge color, those can be different. And edges are lines, nodes are circles. Um, and this will, and again, this will work with any, hierarch any hierarchical data structure. Any directed acyclic graph can be uh, plotted using this uh, technique. And we'll see some other examples of these graphs. 
Um, so I'd like to talk about some of the classes that are defined by the taxa package. This shows a, a few, uh, most of them. Um, the, the one that's the building block for most of the others is this taxon class. It takes a rank, a name, and an ID, um, and is what's used internally in all the classes that contain multiple tax, all the ones above that one. I'm just going to talk about the tax map class, which is basically the same as the taxonomy class, but it adds user-defined database. It's like mapping data to a taxonomy, and that's what we're going to be, that's pretty much the only one I'm going to be talking about because it's really the most useful one. This is an example of a printout of the tax map class. We have some taxon names in front, and we have these arbitrary, unique identifiers um, that are generated by the parsers if there's no database identifiers to use. And so anything in green you see is all these taxon IDs. And these are used to map the taxa in that tree structure to all the user-defined data. They're also used to define this edge list, which is a way of, of encoding a tree structure. Um, so, and the, these, these data sets can be named anything. They're arbitrary, they're user-defined. It's actually just a list. You can put any, any R object you want in there. It only really is a benefit to put in um, tables, vectors, or lists inside this, uh, these data sets because if a table has a tax and ID column, the class understands that those rows correspond to those tax. Uh, if they're named by tax and IDs, if it's a vector or a list and they're named by tax and IDs, so the, the filtering functions and the plotting functions, they all understand that this data is associated with those IDs. And we'll see the utility of that um, soon. So to get all those diverse formats I showed you previously into this um, class, we have a set of three parsers that can be used in a lot of different ways. Um, this figure sh is a kind of a guide that's available in our vignette that shows how you would get all these diverse kind of formats into um, these classes. In the rows, uh, you see different possible sources of taxonomic information. Um, the one you want is a full classification going from like you know species to domain or whatever you have. And if you have that, you don't need to look anything up because all the information is there, so that's ideal. Uh, you might also have a taxon ID. Here's an example of an NCBI taxon ID for Homo sapiens. That's what NCBI thinks we are. And uh, you might have a taxon name. From with, and you need, then you need to look up all the other uh, tax that's part of. Or you might have a sequence ID, and usually this would be an NCBI, um, GemBank sequence ID. And then in the columns, you might, this might appear as a vector of these things. It might be a column in a table, as we saw with the Smithsonian and Archaea databases. Or it might be pieces of some complex string, like the FASTA headers. So for every combination of input type, an input format, there's one of three functions can, can read this. And th they're very flexible. We really haven't encountered much formats that we can't read, although there isn't like formats for specific. There's no like GBIF parser. It's just like you use one of these and you, you parameterize it in order to work with that data. And I'll show you some examples of different, how you uh, read in different formats. If you have a, a um, vector of classifications, you use parse tax data and you give it a separator and it will spit out a tax map object. It will generate arbitrary IDs. That's because taxa can have the same name. Taxa names are not unique. And then it also, the original input data is included in the object as one of these user defined data sets. If you have a, a vector of names, it, it will look this information up from a database. In this case we're using NCBI but uh, you can use other databases. And you need an internet connection for this. And you say it's a taxon name. And, uh, and now we're not using those arbitrary IDs anymore. We're using NCBI's IDs. And other information that was looked up associated with these taxa is added in this tax data table and our original inputs also here. Uh, it's very similar if you want to use taxon IDs or sequence IDs. I won't show the output, but you just change this type parameter. If you have a table, like this is the GBIF Archaea database I showed you previously that has um, taxonomic information in columns four through eight, you would um, use the same function um, for looking up, th for parsing things that are not uh, online. 
just to find the columns that this information is in. You have the original table here, and uh, you have an additional tax and ID column. If you have these like complex strings, it gets you need regular expressions to, to do this. Um, if you're not familiar with regular expressions, they're a type of pattern matching language. So uh, in this case, we're just using a regular expression to identify this uh, GemBank accession number here. And then we're using this key, which it has one value per capture group. Those are these parentheses here in this regular expression that says this is a sequence ID and everything else that comes after it is just some kind of arbitrary info that we want to capture but isn't a source of taxonomic information. Then we then it, again, it uses the NCBI IDs, and um, that uh, the regular expression matches are now in query data, and the NCBI's information is in tax data, and we get all this, all this, um, the whole hierarchy based on this accession number here. So now that you have this information in this format, uh, there's various functions that will give you, will give you insights into this, uh, into your taxonomy and your associated data. Before I go into those, I'd like to talk about just some terminology used in this package, and we'll be using it, this, this uh, tree as an example. Here's a, a taxonomic tree of proteobacteria. So uh, important concepts are subtaxa and supertaxa, and you can think about these recursively or non-recursively, and uh, the, sub, the functions that use these terms usually have a recursive option, and that's why I bring that up. Um, so for example, if you look on the top left, um, all the red taxa here are subtaxa recursively, um, if you think about it recursively, of this black taxon. If you think about it non-recursively, it's um, just these immediate subtaxa. Same concept for supertaxa, you might you get all of them up to the root. It is a super ta all the red ones here are supertaxa of that black uh, taxon. Really? And um, here you only have the immediate subtaxa, uh, immediate supertaxa. You can also just talk about different uh, parts of the tree. Leaves, roots are kind of intuitive. We also define stems and internodes. And a stem here is anything before the first split. Internodes are things that have a single supertaxon, a single subtaxon. And these actually are useful to identify because you can remove them from the tree and you won't lose any information about the relative relationship of the remaining taxa. So if you want to prune a tree, you can filter those out. So with that in mind, here's just a list of some of the functions that. Um, that this uh, package implements. You can get r names, ranks, and IDs, and I'll show you that. Um, you can get information about parts of the tree, which are leaves, which are roots, the subtaxa of every taxon, things like that. You can get these kind of um, things that return logical vectors. Is it a leaf? Is it a root? Is it a stem? This is useful for filtering, and we'll see some of that. And then things that return counts. So like the number of subtaxa per taxon, the number of observations in a data set per taxon, recursively, non-recursively. Those ones that end in one are the non-recursive variants of that. So there's some the simple ones that just return the names per taxon, name by taxon ID, ranks and IDs are similar. Um, there's the subtax and supertaxa functions, which are um, quite flexible and useful. And this is uh, just their like kind of default usage but it returns all the subtaxa for every taxon. So this is a list of vectors that you can loop over if you need to. Um, if you say recursive equals false, you only get the immediate subtaxa. And uh, there's the ones that return counts of things. Um, number of subtaxa per taxon, number of observations in a particular data set per uh, taxon, things like that. And all these things are useful in, those, in plotting and filtering, and that's why they're there for the most part. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, here's an example object I'll be using on some of these upcoming examples. Uh, it has 17 taxa. It has three data sets. Note there's 17 taxa, and in this first data set, there is six rows. If you plot that in Metacoder with very minimal um, coloring or anything, it looks like this. We have two separate trees, one with a root of plants, one with a root of mammals. So if we use filter taxa, this would be the analogous to dplyr filter. And then we say we want all taxa with a name of plant A, and we want their subtaxa as well. We now have reduced this to five taxa from 17, and we have two rows in this data set instead of six. 
So when you filter the taxonomy and there's no place to reassign that data, it will filter all those data sets as well. And that behavior is optional. There's a lot of ways to vary this behavior, but that's uh, one of them. Um, there's also, and if you plot it, you can see we only have plants now. Um, you can there's also a super tax option. So here we're removing all genera and species by saying we just want families and anything above that. So we now we have six taxa from 17, but we actually didn't lose any rows in this data set, but these taxon IDs were reassigned to the family. So like the, they were assigned to the species, now they're gonna be assigned to the, they got automatically reassigned to the family. And again, this behavior is highly customizable. And now we have plants and mammals, but no genera or species. You can also filter your user-defined data directly and filter the taxonomy as a as a side effect, kind of. So here we're filtering this info table for things that have four legs. You can see we lost three of those rows, and we have tigers, cats, and moles, all of which have four legs. And then we can, the drop tax equals true option will then remove anything that's no longer in there. So both the filter obs and the filter taxa, their function is to filter either your data or the taxonomy, but then keep the data and taxonomy um, correctly mapped together and intact. Um, so we can see when we plot it that we only have taxa that have four legs. Here's tigers, cats, and moles, and people are not here and plants are not here anymore either. Um, there's also the other dplyr analogs, mutate, arrange. Um, I'll show you mutate here if you want to add a column to a data set. This can also add new tables, this can also add new vectors, new lists, but I want to show examples of that. Here we're adding this bipedal column right here. So there's a few more things I could show, but I'd like to get my acknowledgments in before I run out of time. Um, I'd like to thank our OpenSci for uh, you know, providing me with a fellowship that paid for this trip and is funding this work, as well as R and USAR, and um, where I'm employed, Oregon State University, and the USDA Agricultural Research Service, and the Grunwald Lab, which uh, gives me a supportive environment to work in. <coughs> and um, since I have maybe like 30 seconds more, Metacoder can do other cool things. I don't have time to explain this, but I'm welcome to take questions about it if anyone's interested. Um, this is comparing different community structures and what's more abundant in different, at different parts of the human microbiome, uh, doing pairwise comparisons of communities. And it can plot more bigger, complicated trees with multiple roots. This is actually a single graph from a single command. Um, so if you have multiple roots, you get multiple trees, and it gets arranged and named and things like that. So it does other stuff that I didn't cover because um, I was focusing on taxa for this presentation. But uh, with that, I'll be happy to take any uh, questions. Yes? So the question was, is there a way of annotating bootstrap values onto a tree? So these are taxonomic trees, not phylogenetic trees. So the concept of a bootstrap value doesn't really apply. But if you just want to annotate things, you can, you can put text on the edges as well as the nodes. So you could put those values on the lines themselves if you wanted to. But you can put any, any information. It's, it's like ggplot. You just say, I want this here. And it will do the scaling and everything like that. Yes.